When I was in my 20s, I took a job as a park ranger at a state park. It was the perfect job for me at the time. I love working outdoors. Every day presented new challenges and I got to work alone. On days when I could get my work done early, I would find a beautiful spot somewhere in the park and read or listen to music. It was therapeutic. I had just gone through a tough year. School kicked my butt and I had just broken up with my long-term girlfriend. I needed an escape, and the park provided it. While working during the day was amazing, the night shift at the park wasn't as relaxing. Do you know how uncomfortable the night can make even the most comfortable spaces in your house feel? Well, the pitch black of Mother Nature is like that feeling on steroids. The absolute worst place to sit during a night shift was the North End Watchtower. Everyone who worked there called it the Sentinel because it was massive and looked out across the whole of the forest that made up the park. It was tall, just over a hundred feet above the ground and was made of old pine that seemed to retain the scent as if it had just been cut the day before. It was basically like a little cabin on top of really tall stilts. However, inside wasn't exactly a luxury box. And the wall that faced the forest was one large window that gave pretty breathtaking views but was also really good at giving you feelings of vertigo. Inside, there was relatively meager furniture. There were just two chairs, one for sitting in good weather and one insulated one for bad weather, an old desk, a single bare light bulb overhead, and a small fan to help keep you cool. I always brought something to read or write because the night watch in the tower is dull as hell. It was quite a height too. It took about 10 minutes or so to walk the 10 stories, and when you had to do it in the dark at night, it tended to take a little bit longer. Each story you climbed disappeared into the darkness below you. It could be a bit unsettling. Once you're on top of the tower, your job for that shift is to basically look for fires or anything else out of the ordinary. When there was a full moon, you could see so much of the woods. But when there was a new moon or it was cloudy, you couldn't see a thing. If it wasn't for the bare light bulb in the cabin, you couldn't see anything. And typically, you keep in touch with people on the walkie and just idle away the hours. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I never dozed off for a while, but if you had to come to visit me some nights, I might have had some sleep creases on my face. Most nights, when I was in the Sentinel, I brought a book and read or a journal to write in, and basically occupying my mind for the shift and ignore the dark. The rangers, especially the older ones, loved to tell stories about the weird stuff they had seen over the years. People tend to think of parks as safe zones where the most deadly thing can happen is an animal attack. And yes, while animal attacks do occur, most of the violence comes from people. Campers, drunk, will get into fights or fall into fire pits, or get lost on the way to the bathroom. And drifters will sneak into the park and stay in unoccupied cabins or buildings. I cannot tell you the number of times I've walked into squatters chilling in a distant ranger cabin and I've had to evict them. But one thing no one outside the world of park rangers likes to talk about is that parks, especially at night, tend to be a haven for criminals. I know it sounds crazy at the outset, but it happens. Horrible things, murders, drug activity, you name it, it happens. I was lucky to never deal with any of the more heavy stuff, a few times we found drugs to be sold or a small patch of marijuana growing in the woods, but nothing horrifying. But if you put your time in at the park, eventually you'll run across something that will haunt your dreams. Not too far from where our park was, there is a correctional facility. It wasn't Alcatraz or anything that high security, but the people there were serious criminals. It was a distance away. But on clear nights, you could barely make out the lights from the yard along the horizon. But it loomed large in your imagination. 
Your rational brain knew that any criminal would have to brave the dangerous forest in pitch black before they ran into you. But a tiny flicker of light kept a corner of your brain illuminated. It could happen. It won't, but it could. It was near the end of summer and uh, some of these staff had already split for the year. I was on for a few more weeks and I was going to get night duty for most of those days since I was the lowest on the totem pole. The worst, I would be on sentinel duty those nights. Now, I know having the least amount of seniority was the main reason, but I know that my boss and a few older rangers play poker those nights as well. Since I had no money or skills, I was sent up into the tower. As the sun was starting to set, I walked into the central station at the park entrance. A few rangers were milling about, shooting the crap. A day shift was relaying night shift things they should be aware of, that kind of stuff. It mainly was nothing. Not a ton of campers in the park this time of year. Just a few sightings of bears nearby. Someone also swears they saw a bobcat but wasn't sure. But then someone walked into the station and the tenor of the night shifted. Excuse me, a woman about 40 said in an overly polite way. She was dressed in leggings and my guess was she was here to walk the trails. My boss and the want-to-be Casanova, Jonesy, noticed the outfit and lack of wedding ring and shot her his 10 cent smile. Welcome to the state park. How can I help you today? He said, his words dripping with Sacherine. Um, hi, she said, a little taken aback. I wanted to report something, well, maybe report is a bit extreme, but just make you aware of something I saw out on the trails. Sure, what did you see? She shifted her weight a little uneasy, it seemed. I clocked it and thought it was a little unusual. Sometimes when people see a bear or a bobcat, two things that have been spotted recently, they might have their adrenaline pumping and be a bit jittery, but this wasn't that. Um, it sounds crazy, but, um, I think I saw something stalking me out in the woods. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Probably gave you a bit of a scare, Jonesy said. We've had a few bear and bobcat sightings lately. No, she said definitively. It wasn't a bear or a cat. I think it was a person. What trail? A sandalwood loop B, I think it's called. That's not far from a few campgrounds and fishing cabins. They didn't look like a camper. Everyone in the cabin had stopped talking and turned their attention to the woman. She noticed and you could see the red rush to her cheeks. What did they look like? Um, they looked shadowy, she said. Like they were afraid of the sun or something. And they were following you. I caught something in the corner of my eye around the last turn of the loop. I stopped and pretended to stretch, and saw something in the woods just off the trail. They were hiding behind a tree, eyeballing me. Jesus, Jonesy said. I'm sorry that happened to you. Thank you, she said, her voice going soft. They, they, they followed me until I nearly got to the end of the loop. I started running then and lost sight of them. Jonesy turned back to two of the older rangers and told them to hop in a gator cart and check out the woods for anything. He told them to keep their walkies on and take a sidearm just in case. They left in a flash and Jonesy turned his attention to the woman. Can you tell me anything that might help? And did they have any kind of identifiable clothing? Did they speak to you? Did they? They she interrupted. They made noises. Noises? Jonesy asked, slightly confused. Yes, a few. They made a kind of chittering noise and a, a faint um, yelling kind of sound. Possibly cicadas. Another older ranger said, a group of them can scare the fur off a cat. Maybe, I, I don't know. They also whistled but not like they were whistling at me. It's, it's like they were trying to blend in with nature. Can you describe the noise? 
she whistled something that I knew right away. That sounds like a wood thrush. How do you know that? Jonesy said, not being able to help himself. My grandpa was an avid bird watcher. He turned his attention back to the woman. Did you want to file a police report or... No, 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 she said quickly. I don't even have that much information. I just was scared and wanted to let you know just in case. Are you sure? Yes, she said. I don't think anyone else was on the trail after me, but I didn't feel right at not telling you. I'm sorry that happened to you here. The park is supposed to be a place to relax. She laughed nervously, and Jonesy shot her a calming smile. Here's my card, he said, handing her one. If you change your mind, please call me. She pocketed it and nodded. She turned to leave and then stopped. She turned back and after a brief pause said, Something else that was weird. I saw this thing on both sides of the trail. He crossed behind you. I didn't notice him doing that, but he must because I saw him on both sides. Unless there were more than one of them, I said, instantly regretting it. Jonesy turned and gave me a Jesus dude look and I clammed up. Do you need someone to escort you to your car, ma'am? No, I'm right out there. Thanks, though. She said as she walked at the door. We heard her motor away a few moments later. Sorry. I said before Jones he could say anything. He sighed. No worries, just don't go freaking out the gas. We need people like her to come back. People like or her to come back, right? Was I too obvious? Jonesy said with a smile. What do you think she saw? I asked. A Wendigo. One of the other rangers said and everyone laughed. Have you read about Wendigos and skinwalkers in a mythology class? I didn't find it so amusing. It might have been her eyes playing tricks in her. If someone is out there, those two will find them. They're good at tracking. And whatever is out there couldn't have gotten too far. A great night to be up in the tower, I said with a smirk. Hey, that's probably the safest place to be, Jonesy said. No one climbs at ten stories if they don't have to. I hung around for about another half hour or so to see what came with the trackers. They came back and said there wasn't anything around the sandalwood loop. No footprints of anything they saw. Granted, the leaves had started to fall so it was hard to see anything on the ground but I trusted their tracking skills. Not going to lie, even with the guys coming back empty-handed, I was still a bit nervous about the shift. Jonesy was right, though. No one climbs stairs unless they have to. This is still America, after all. Laziness always wins. Also, there was nothing in the cabin above the trees except me, a book, and a journal. Nothing worth making the journey. As the sun slid behind the horizon, I started my trek to the Sentinel. When I got to the platform at the bottom, something caught my eye. The tower base is lousy, with stickers, tags, and names carved into the pine. Usually it's Joe plus Jane forever, or something along those lines, but what had been freshly cut was a bit different. It was a pair of eyes. Had the earlier events not happened, I probably wouldn't have even noticed the eyes. I chalked it up to my mind, already being primed to see some spooky stuff. I assumed it had been some kids earlier or one of the older rangers looking to give me a scare. Whatever it was, I did a quick glance around me before I started up the stairs. From the vantage point high above the trees, you can see storms come rolling in. Tonight was no exception. It was a waning crescent moon tonight, so it would be a bit dark, but those rain clouds made it pitch black. The only natural light that I would see would be the occasional burst of lightning inside the clouds. The wind had picked up too. You could tell because there is a slight shift in the tower wind, the wind gust. Not a lot, but just enough to notice. You get used to it, but when it first hits, it can be a bit jarring. 
There were a few wind gusts, but I settled in for the evening, and I stopped noticing. About an hour later, my walkie crackled to life. How's the view? It was Jonesy. Great, I said. Oh, we're about to do a pass around the park. I wanted to give you a heads up. I leaned forward in my chair and glanced through the window towards the base. I saw Jonesy and a few other rangers getting into their gator carts to head out. Their headlights were bright, but only because there was literally no other light down there. The beams themselves only saw a few feet in front of you. Hey, thanks. You guys need me to scout anything for you. No, we'll be fine, but hey, if you see any wendigos, let me know, okay? Funny, I said. If you hear any thrushes singing, run. Those boys should all be in bed by now. I'll keep that in mind. Be back in a half hour, 40 minutes tops. Over and out. I sat and I placed on my walkie and watched those tiny ants drive off into the woods and out of sight. I kicked back in my chair and started reading again. And that's when I heard a board creak. At first, my mind assumed it was probably just the wind pushing the tower. It can cause a creaking sound in the tower. But my brain pushed away the fog of rationality, and a more terrible thought became clear. What if someone was outside the door? I would have heard them walking up the stairs, right? I looked around for anything I could use as a weapon. Outside of smashing my walkie or flashlight into this potential person's head, there wasn't much. If I did need to escape, light and communication would probably be a good thing to have. I didn't want to go and break essential equipment. I grabbed my walkie and pressed the button. Jonesy, I said, trying to sound confident. Jonesy, you out there? I knew there was a chance that he might be out of range. Sometimes these walkies can be wonky in the forest and I was praying that he would respond. But the longer I heard the static, the less hope I had he could hear me. Jonesy, just curious if you guys had circled back this way. Finally. Yeah, Ned forgot his lights and we came back. But we're heading out now. Okay, I said. Hey, odd question. But did anyone come up to the Sentinel by chance? Just you. He said and then added. Why? Thought I... thought I heard a board creak. It's breezy tonight, a storm coming in. Probably just the wind. Or the wind to go. He said, chuckling to himself. Have fun, I said, ending the conversation. I put my walkie back down and stared at the door that led to the stairs. The odds that someone would have walked up here to put a scare in me was remote. Like Jonesy said earlier... No one walks ten stories unless they have to. But what if the woman from earlier had seen someone, or a group, and they were looking for a place to hide out? Would the Sentinel be a good choice? Maybe. I don't know how the criminal mind works. Regardless, for my own sanity, I would have to swing that door open and see if anyone was there. It was probably nothing, but I needed to be sure. If not, the rest of my shift was going to be miserable. I quietly walked across the cabin to the door and grabbed the handle. I counted down from three in my head and I swung the door open. There was nothing there. In the distance, a flash of lightning crashed and thunder rolled. But no person was standing there. I sighed and then stepped out onto the landing. You could really feel the breeze up here now. That storm was moving in quickly. You could smell the rain coming. The earthy scent that the raindrops stir up was all around me. Even though I was sure no one was outside the cabin, I wanted to check out the stairs just in case. I walked over to the stairs and stared down. In the darkness, the stories below me just merged with the night. I couldn't see anything. I pulled on my flashlights and shone the beam down the stairs to the next landing. The flashlights we had were decent but not ideal. Cops got 1,000 lumen flashlights to shine in your eyes when they pull you over, and we were lucky to get half that. It's not like we would need adequate lights working in the pitch black or anything. I walked down to the first landing and glanced around. Nothing seemed out of place. 
I flashed my light down to the next landing, and something caught my eye. The light reflected off of something on the stairs. Not unlike a toddler, I made my way to the shiny object. I was a little surprised to find a small piece of reflective strip on the stairs. I didn't remember seeing it on the way up. I would have picked it up to throw it away. It looked like it had been ripped off a jacket or uniform or something. But how did it get here? The wind might have blown this up from a campsite, but that felt wrong. It was. I turned to climb back up to the cabin when I froze. On the railing, something had carved another set of eyes. I didn't move. I stood there as my brain tried to piece together an excuse that made sense, but it was failing. Even when I started to feel the patter of rain on my face, I didn't move. What the heck was going on? Fearing that someone might be looking at me, I clicked off my flashlight. I know I said earlier that I didn't want to waste essential tools, but at this point, I was ready to brain someone until the thing broke. The rain started to come down a bit harder, which helped to break me from my fugue state. I was about to start back up towards the cabin when I heard the floorboards above me squeak. There was a crash of thunder nearby, and it barely registered in my mind. I was so tuned into the symphony of pine stairs that a bomb could have blown off near me and I would miss it. After what felt like 17 hours, I hadn't heard anything else, and I relaxed a little bit. It was probably nothing. My mind was overactive, and I was red, stringing together disparate events into a cohesive narrative to scare myself. I was sure that was it. And then I heard something drag across the pine above me. It sounded like someone was gouging at the wood. I didn't know what to do. My legs felt like jello. I wanted to go streaming down the stairs, but I was afraid I would make too much noise. Plus, the idea of running down eight stories of now wet steps didn't sound ideal. I slowly started making my way towards these stairs heading down, when the gouging noises above me stopped. After a slight pause, I heard footsteps head towards the door of the cabin. Someone was up there, I was sure of it. What they wanted to do well, I didn't want to think about it. I slowly started down the stairs, careful to not let any of them squeak underneath me. I kept my flashlight off and just descended into the darkness. I reached for where my walkie should be and cursed to myself when I realized that I had left it up there. As if on cue, I heard the cabin door swing back open and heard an object crashing through the trees towards the ground. As it passed me, I heard the familiar static of the walkie. Whatever was in the cabin had just tossed my only lifeline to the outside world. Well, crap, that wasn't good. I hastened my trip down the stairs. As I rounded the landing for the sixth story, I suddenly heard the familiar call of a wood thrush three landings below me. Only, the thrushes were gone at this time of night. This, this was a person. He made the noise again, and it clicked as to why they would give their position up. He was signaling to the person above me. He was letting him know where I was. One above, one below. I was trapped. Above me, I heard someone start down the steps. They moved slow and steady, deliberate. Whoever was up there was coming down to me, and I had nowhere to go. I thought about jumping down and trying to grab a branch on the way, but knew that would end poorly for me in the best of scenarios and deadly in the worst. They rounded the second story down. I was running out of time for a plan. I could run down the stairs and try to bull rush whoever was down there, but the rain was coming down hard now, and we could slip and fall off the tower. The only thing I had going for me was the darkness. I had the only light and outside of the occasional lightning flash, it was dark as hell. It would cloak me if I could find a good spot. As he rounded the landing above me, I made a decision that, looking back, was one of the wildest things I've ever done in my life. I wake up some nights gasping for breath because I dreamed about doing this. 
The instinct to survive is so deeply ingrained in our animal brain that I suppressed all the fear I would usually have and just acted. As quietly as I could, I climbed over the handrail on the landing and hung off the side of the stairs. My feet felt for the handrail on the landing below me to help steady me, but my toes just grazed against the wood. I couldn't reach them. My arms started burning as they held my weight. I clawed into the wood with my hands, hoping my nails digging into the pine would counteract my wet palms. I closed my eyes partially to shut out the pain in my arms and partly because I was afraid the whites of my eyes would get noticed. I heard the footsteps turn the corner and start to come down the stairs right next to me. I held my breath. My arms were burning and I was so afraid I would lose my grip. The person took the steps one at a time, slow as possible. They were looking for me on the landing but didn't see me. Suddenly, whatever it was started chittering into the darkness. A few seconds later, the wood thrush called back. The footsteps stopped coming down the stairs and started going back up. No, no. In a flash, a solution came to me. I used my right foot to kick off my left boot. Suddenly, I was glad I didn't take Jonesy's advice to keep the laces as tight as a drum. I kicked my boot onto the landing below me, and they landed with a heavy crash. The footsteps stopped going up the stairs. I freed my other boot, and it crashed down next to their partner on the landing. It sounded like I was down there. The footsteps walked right past me, heading down quickly to surprise me on the landing below. As soon as they rounded the corner, I called upon all the strength of my body and quickly pulled myself back up over the railing. I landed with a thud, which gave away the ghost. I popped up and dashed up the stairs to the top of the cabin. I knew they would be right behind me, so I didn't hesitate. In seconds, I was at the top of the stairs and outside the cabin door. I was met with another pair of eyes carved into the wood. They stared back at me, watching and waiting to see what I was going to do next. I dashed into the cabin and leaned against the door to brace against anyone trying to burst in. I knew two people, at least I hoped they were people, were coming, and they were not going to stop until they got into the cabin. Another bolt of lightning flashed nearby and the ensuing thunder shook the tower. Things were close. I glanced up and noticed that someone had carved another set of eyes staring at me just above the window. Only this time, they left a message with the picture. You watch us, but who's watching you? I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I swallowed hard as I heard two sets of footprints reach at the top of the landing. Sure enough, they charged into the door, pushing it open slightly. I braced hard against the door and started yelling. Just the most primal screaming I've ever done. They kept thumping the door. Each thrust pushed the door open a bit more and a bit more. I was struggling to hold out against them. I was tired and my socks were slipping on the wood. It was only a matter of time until they burst through. I thought about my life. I thought about my parents, my friends. All the things I'd never get to do. And then the hair in my arms started to stand on end. And then my leg hair. And then my hair started to rise. Only, it wasn't fear that was causing this. It was something much more primal. Much more natural. Much more powerful. I dashed across the room and sat on the insulated stool. A beat up wooden seat with glass legs and held at my feet. As the door burst open... I saw two sets of eyes staring at me. The two faces grinned, and the cabin light reflected off the blade of a knife. I screamed as everything went white, and what sounded like the sky splitting in two erupted around us. Lightning had struck the tower. I was safe. Glass and wood are bad conductors, but the two men who were standing in a puddle weren't as lucky. The blast had shocked them and sent them tumbling down the side of the tower. When I opened my eyes, I could see the burn marks across the pine and smell the fire that had been started. Without giving anything a second thought, 
I dashed out of the door, careful not to catch myself on fire, and ran down the stairs of the Sentinel. It may take 10 minutes to climb up, but it took me only about 2 minutes to get down. As soon as I hit the bottom landing, I saw the lights of the gator carts pull up. I collapsed in the ground as Jonesy and the other rangers rushed over to me. I glanced up and saw his face and I started to sob. Above him, the flames licked and ate away the tower floor by floor. It would burn for over an hour. I later learned that the two men killed by the lightning were escaped convicts from the jail. Both of them had beat up a guard, grabbed their clothes, and headed out into the woods three days earlier. The escape had been kept quiet because they didn't want to spook anyone and thought that they would track them down in the woods sooner rather than later. Why scare people if you didn't have to? And also, forget that noise. They both had been convicted of murder, and I swear to God, this is what the police told me. The criminals had ill intent for me. I told the officers I had gathered that. Thinking back, they probably watched me climb up the tower later and saw an easy target. When I had first heard the floorboard squeak outside the door, the criminal that had followed me up made a quick decision to climb up onto the roof of the cabin to prevent me from seeing him until he was ready. I probably didn't hear anything on the roof because of the fan and the rain. I think about what he could have done to me had he caught me by surprise, jumping down from the roof and shudder. At best, I would be stabbed by a madman. At worst, I would tumble ten stories to my death. Either way, not a great thing to linger on during idle hours. That was my last day as a ranger. I was due back to school in a few weeks, and I needed time to calm my nerves. Everyone understood. They even paid me out for the week, which was nice. I also took a small part of the Sentinel as a memento of the ordeal. Every time I look at the piece of wood I took from the tower, I wasn't reminded of what could have happened to me, but instead, of what I did to survive. Someone was watching me that night, but it wasn't just the criminals. It was nature herself.